identical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are titles in thy names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. So we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but is an erroneous name. In a minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove to you that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters, letters or characters in their alphabet that will produce the sound that is made by the letter J. And neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and correct name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. And we have Yahweh in His pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Now, Yahweh is not a cloud. We merely chose a cloud to symbolize. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has any particular descriptive shape and form. And we have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you, to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, Everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. And Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being. That is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now, this form could only be seen in divine visions and only understood by divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself into a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also, in this school, we teach by divine pattern of the, of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses up top Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place and a court that goes round about. Now, these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern and we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of the threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing can escape the pattern. Our primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh as he really is and as he actually exists. 
Second is to form together a nucleus of universal brotherhood in humanity without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or the so-called law of nature and the power latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and to promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to expertise current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, the demon, or Satan, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh declared from the beginning, ordained that there is no other name given among men whereby men must be saved, saving in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal, eternal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. The scripture lesson for this evening will be Ephesians, the second chapter, which will be read by Dr. Myra Quates. But first, we will have our prayer, which will be which will be by Dr. DeAndre San Sancho. May we have our prayer. May we all bow heart to mind. We like to thank you, Heavenly Father Yahweh, for allowing us to meet in the bonds of peace, um, to hear this great gospel, and to hear the truth and words of wisdom. And we just pray that you please keep us steadfast and just please keep us in the way and just please, uh, just please keep us and, and just keep us in your everlasting love and in, in your arms and just please guide and lead and teach us to get us, to get us through these perilous times that we're living through. And all this we ask in your beloved son's name, Yahshua the Messiah. May we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be reading Ephesians, the second chapter, from a King James Zondervan Bible with the true names and titles and poles. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But Yahweh, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath he quickened us together with the Messiah, by grace you are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Yahshua the Messiah, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Yahshua the Messiah. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of Yahweh, not of works, least any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Yahshua the Messiah unto good works, which Yahweh hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without Yahshua in the world. But now in Yahshua the Messiah, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who hath made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in him of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto Yahweh in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the sons and of the household of Yahweh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Yahshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you all also are built together for a habitation of Yahweh through the Spirit. That was Ephesians second chapter. Hallelujah. Oh, I woke up early this morning. My heart was beating right all time. I said that, Yahshua, I want to thank you for opening up these eyes of mine. As I look out through my window, and I looked out through the shade, once again I had to tell them, thank you, y'all. Well, let me see another day. Now the sun was bright and shining. The wind blowing not too strong. And the tree house just a few feet away was a running, singing a song. I don't know what he was singing, but pretty soon he was on his way. Said he wasn't being great, great love. And let him see another day. Everybody ought to praise. Be thankful and praise. Everybody ought to praise. What well, does it that brother can say? Thank you. You can do it. I woke up early this morning. My heart was beating like all night. I said that Yahshua, I want to thank you for opening up the side of mine. As I looked out through my window. And I looked out through the shade. Once again, I had to tell Thank you, Lord. Oh, let me be another day. Now the sun is shining. The wind blowing back to the sun.
Thank you, <laughs> Northside Choir. <laughs> um, our first speaker for this evening uh, will be a pleasure to call on Dr. Lisa Villanueva. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to first start by giving all praise to Yahshua Messiah. And if y'all were willing, I'd like to just lay a foundation for the next speaker. Uh, as I always like to stay, say when I start out is uh, that this is a school and it's not a church. And we come to the school to learn something about our Heavenly Father. And what we found when we came into the school, at least I know I did, is that what I thought I understood about God or what I thought I understood about my Heavenly Father was incorrect. Um, so there are a lot of people out here who are searching and are looking for their Heavenly Father, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have an accurate roadmap uh, when we're, we're not being led and guided um, by His Spirit. Uh, and so one of the first things we learn in the school is that Yahweh is Spirit. In John 4, 24, it says, says, Yahweh is Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And if we look at this Moses chart, what we refer to as the Moses chart, uh, and as the moderator stated, we have uh, Yahweh, who is spirit, depicted as a cloud. Not that he is a cloud, but this cloud is a good example, what we often refer to as a type or a shadow, uh, that would help us to understand something about spirit, because spirit is incomprehensible and inscrutable. Uh, with our finite senses, we're not going to understand anything about Yahweh. So it necessitates Yahweh to find a way to make himself known to his creatures. And since we can't understand Yahweh in his pure spirit state, according to his foreknowledge and his will, um, and let me just back up by saying, as the moderator stated, Yahweh is spirit, and spirit is the source and substance of intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. It's not that Yahweh, or whom the world would call the Lord, is wise, but he is the source from which wisdom is derived. He is wisdom. He is the source of these attributes. And that is an abstract state. And so that's why a cloud is a great example of something that we can use to get across to our finite minds what it is to be abstract. So this cloud has no particular shape and form, but when, according to Yahweh's purpose, these nine primary divine attributes come together into a set shape and form, this is what we refer to as the word or son of Yahweh. And when you look at your scriptures, uh, it will say, for some of the prophets there, it will say, the word appeared to um, Isaiah, or the word appeared to Obadiah, or the, the, these prophets would have visions of the word of Yahweh, or the word of Yahweh came unto me saying, okay, this word or son is Yahweh in shape and form. And these attributes take on a set shape and form, and it's uh, a heavenly anthropomorphic being. And what that simply means is that he has the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And what we often do is we often say super. Have you ever heard the word uber? I believe that's German for super. This is a super incorporeal being. So what we're trying to do by explaining the, using the word super is to differentiate this incorporeal being 
from the angelic. He is above the angels, see? So we need to make a distinction. And as Dr. Kinley, the founder of the school, who had a vision in 1931 in Springfield, Ohio, stated, you know, he said that Yahweh appeared unto him as a man because we understood something about man and his limitations, but he appeared as a man without limit. Okay, and so that helps us to wrap our finite minds around the creator of heaven and our earth. Okay, but he appeared as a man, but without limit. So he has lost no power in this move from pure spirit to shape and form. These are still invisible to our naked eye. But again, according to the purpose of Yahweh, this divine this uh, super incorporeal being got into a physical body and walked the earth plane known as Yashar Messiah. And what this move from pure spirit to incorporeal to the visible or the concrete, it sets up the unity of the spirit. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, it states, Hear, O Israel, listen carefully, Israel. Yahweh our Elohim is Yahweh a unity. And in 1 John 5 and 7, it states that there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the word or son and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, okay? So we have a unity and not a trinity. And so it's important that we understand these things because this really helps us to understand who Yahweh is and how he operates when we start to look at this unity of the spirit. Uh, now, <clears throat> I was talking about how the prophets saw visions of Elohim, and let's use Moses as an example. Let's get Exodus 24, 9 and 10. We just want to show that Moses saw Elohim, and then we're going to get Revelation, the first chapter, and show that John, who's on the Isle of Patmos, not to be confused with John the Baptist, John on the Isle of Patmos, he also saw a vision of Yahweh Elohim, or this word or son. Okay, so let's start wherever our scripture readers are with Exodus 24, 9 and 10. This is Exodus 24, 9 and 10. And then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there were under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in its clearness keep going. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw the God and did eat and drink. See, they saw Yahweh Elohim, or they saw uh, in the King James Bible, it says they saw God and didn't eat and drink. So we see that not only did Moses see this Elohistic form, or this super incorporeal shape and form. But Aaron, Nadab, and Abayu, and 70 elders also saw him. The difference between what these people here on the plateau of this mount saw versus what Moses saw is that Moses was given an understanding of this uh, super incorporeal form, all right? We'll get back to that in a moment. Could we get Revelation, the first chapter, and um, just talk about how Yahweh Elohim showed himself to Moses, I'm sorry, to John? You want to start at nine uh, about the yeah, you, you can uh, cut it over twelve. Me. Yeah, a man uh, walking in the branch. Oh, miss of the seven branch golden candlestick. Okay. Um. All right. This is Revelations one, and I'll start at. Hmm. I'll start at nine, and I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of and patience of Yahshua the Messiah was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of Yahweh and for the testimony of Yahshua Messiah. I was in the spirit on the Sabbath day and heard behind me a great voice as a, as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven assemblies, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Continue. Yes. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as the flame of fire. And his feet likened unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay, that's good. So I just wanted to show that there's a vision that John is beholding, and that's how he's able to write uh, the things that are in the book of Revelation. And also Moses, who's the attributed writer of the first five books of the Bible. And if I'm not mistaken, John also has five books attributed to him in the so-called New Testament. So going back to Moses, we see that Yahweh Elohim revealed himself to Moses. And what I was saying is that the difference between the folks here on this plateau who saw Yahweh Elohim and Moses is that Moses was given an understanding. And that understanding was gained by this tabernacle pattern. Now, Yahweh Elohim, as the moderator state, Elohim is the archetype, which means original pattern of the universe. And Yahweh Elohim uh, is who... Um, cre created the heavens and the earth, and he showed Moses how he went about to create the creation by the pattern, uh, which is himself. So you'll see here, close up a little bit, um, that you've got the pattern here. It's an intangible pattern, and then Yahweh Elohim transformed back into himself, and then he showed Moses how he created according to the pattern. Um, in Moses' first day of Moses' vision, he showed him um, darkness and light being separated and the waters above and the waters beneath and so on and so forth until the sixth day where he created man in his image and likeness and he brought forth Eve from Adam and then he rested. The remaining 33 days of the total of 40 days that Moses was on this mount, he was shown the inner workings of this pattern. And Yahweh Elohim admonished Moses to construct a physical tabernacle well, I should say it this way, to construct a tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai amongst the children of Israel, like the one he was shown in the mouth. And we can go over and see a better example of this tabernacle that was constructed on this chart. And we can see that it is threefold, yet one, just like we said, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit is threefold, yet one, or unity. Uh, we've got the most holy place, the holy place, and the court, which went round about. See, these three compartments make up this one tabernacle pattern, and so that's the structure. We also have an operation that's happening in this pattern, and we can follow that operation by watching uh, how this high priest operated in this, in this tabernacle. Um, he would go through the gate. That's the first step. He would get to this altar of uh, sin sacrifice, the second step, um, and then he would be at this altar. This is the third step. Um, this is where the uh, sacrifices were washed. And uh, this is also uh, the fourth step here is this whole, this veil that separated the court roundabout from the holy place. And this is where the high priest was anointed before he could actually go through this veil and officiate in the holy place. And in the holy place, we, which is the fifth step, we have three major vessels, the seven branch lampstand, the table of shoe bread with 12 loaves of bread and the altar of incense. And then when we go through the second veil, which is the sixth step, according to the pattern, it's called uh, the second veil or the veil of the flesh. It's lavishly embellished with angels, uh, these veils. And when you go through this most holy place, which the high priest could only do one time a year on the day of atonement, he would go before this um, throne of Yahweh, let's call it. And it had a mercy seat, and it had two archangels, and Yahweh dwelt in a cloud between the wings of the cherubim. And within this mercy seat was Aaron's rod that budded, a cup of hidden manna, and the uh, Ten Commandment law. And so these, these vessels, this is the seven steps that the high priest would go through, and this would be likened to Yahweh operation, okay? And um, 
we also had three major vessels here in the court roundabout. So you have three major vessels, the altar, the brazen laver, and the cup of holy anointing oil, that's three. You have three major vessels here, and you have a three-in-one configuration here. So you have three, six, nine. And that ties back to these nine attributes that we talked about earlier, which is what Yahweh is, or spirit. And these are major or primary attributes. They're not the only attributes. So um, this pattern becomes very important to understand how Yahweh is operating. And what we find is if we look at some of the um, Bible, so-called Bible stories, we'll find that there's a principle of a death, like these animals had to be sacrificed because if the people who uh, disobeyed the law of Moses or the law contained in ordinances, they had to offer up the appropriate sacrifice and that innocent animal died instead of the person. So you have a principle of death, you have a principle of burial uh, because these um, sacrifices had to be washed before they were offered up. And then you have a principle of resurrection, which would be like unto you know, the spirit before you can go through this door which is the fourth step. So you've got principle of four, and then you've got this whole holy place, which is five, and you've got principles of light, the lampstand, sustenance or food um, with the bread, and also intercession because with the sacrifices that were offered up daily here, there was a stench happening here in this court roundabout. And this altar sac I'm sorry, altar of incense is where these four ingredients were burned <clears throat> and the scent would waffle up into most holy place in the nostrils of Yahweh and would take away the stench of what was happening down here in this court roundabout. So it was a sweet smelling savor onto Yahweh Elohim in the nostrils of Yahweh. <clears throat> and then like I said, this is I refer to this as like a throne because this is where Yahweh said he would dwell above the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim. And <clears throat> when we start to examine the principles in this pattern, we start to see how Yahweh is operating. So if we go back to our migratory pattern, which is on this Moses chart, we'll find that <clears throat> the trek of the children of Israel out of Egypt or bondage into the wilderness of Sinai and then ultimately into Canaan land, which is the land that was promised to their forefather, Abraham, that in his seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. But first they had to go down into a land they knew out of and be evilly entreated, that they would come out with great substance and inherit a land flowing with milk and honey, or this Canaan land. And uh, we understand that this trek or this migration is threefold, just like the pattern is threefold. We've got the Court roundabout would be compared to Egypt. The holy place would be compared to the wilderness of Sinai. And the most holy place of the pattern would can be as compared to Canaan land, all right? Uh, so you have to find your principles of death, burial, and resurrection in this pattern. So what we often do is we refer to Moses's um, being commissioned to come down into the land of Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go his people being the children of Israel. And there were 10 devastating plagues that were poured out on the land of Egypt because Pharaoh would not heed the warning or what was spoken through Moses. And ultimately the children of Israel were commissioned or commanded to take out a lamb and to slay, uh, to pierce it in the side and to put the blood on the two side posts on the lintel from a basin. And this blood had to be on the inside of their door. And this blood was a sign or a token that would cause the death angel who was going to kill any uh, firstborn man or beast who did not have this sign or this seal on the inside of their door would kill that firstborn in that house or in that home. And so what we've come to learn is that this is a principle of blood or death. Okay. Now, once the children of Israel were obedient to that, uh, Yahweh didn't suffer that anyone would die the firstborn would die in their household. Um, but the firstborn of anyone that didn't have the seal, they would be dead. So there's your death principle. Now, the children of Israel, after being obedient, they were led to the Red Sea. And this Red Sea was like an onto a veil or a barrier for the children of Israel. And they feared, exceedingly feared, and cried unto Moses. They were concerned that they had been brought out there to die. But Yahweh told the children of Israel to stop. I'm sorry, yeah, through Moses, tell children of Israel to stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. And what Yahweh did was he caused the east wind to come through and to um, put this uh, Red Sea into a heap. 
and they went through on dry ground. So he actually had made provision for them to go through this Red Sea. And so that would be like an Atar water principle. Uh, and they were following a cloud, and I already explained to you that cloud represents spirit. So you have your blood, water, spirit, or your death, burial, resurrection right here with the children of Israel's migration. Now this is an example of a historical event, and you can see that it's following the pattern. And what that shows us is that all things are following the dictates of Yahweh Elohim, because he is like I said earlier, the archetype or original pattern of the universe. Um, now, not only do we see those principles of death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into this uh, wilderness of Sinai, which would be likened unto a holy place, in that tabernacle, and we could see it on this chart. You could see that there's the lampstand, there's the ta a table of showbread, and there's the altar of incense. So we need to find those principles. What are the manifestations of those principles in this wilderness of Sinai? Well, we say it all the time, something I go through quite often when I'm asked to give a testimony, is that the light is that Yahweh, he was a pillar of a cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. So the children of Israel were always in the light. And that would be like an unto your light principle. Uh, you also have Yahweh having rained down manna from heaven. And that manna um, would be like an unto, could be made into this bread and it's, and it's um, these flat cakes. And so you could see that you've got your principle of the shoe bread or the bread coming down. And this helped to sustain the children of Israel, just like this was sustenance for the high, for the priests. Okay. Then you have your incense. I'm sorry. Yes. Your altar of incense. And with the altar of incense, you've got a principle of intercession. All right. And with intercession, we've got to find our intercessor. Now we know that the true and only intercessor is Yahweh Elohim, but we're going to have our type shadows and allegories in our Bible, so-called Bible stories, to help lead us up unto the spirit. We need these things to help us understand something about our invisible uh, creator and how he's operating and how he wants to be worshipped. So Moses, in this example, would be likened unto um, a intercessor. He is not the intercessor, but he is a type and a shadow so that we could see a manifestation of someone going between Yahweh and the people. And you find that the children of Israel, after Yahweh had thundered down this Ten Commandment law into their hearing, they said, oh boy, you know, we don't want to have him speak to us like that again. So Moses, you go talk to him. So you could see that principle of intercession with Moses, okay? Now, that would be uh, those major vessels. I just want to show you how those are manifest. Now, what happens by and by, the children of Israel were supposed to be in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 days. And remember with the tabernacle, we were talking about the steps, and I was talking about how this is the fourth step. Well, that four is manifested here. And that four could be four days, it could be 40 days, it could be it, anything related to four, okay? This is a different manifestation, but it's the same principle. So this door, led them into the wilderness of Sinai. And they were supposed to be out here for 40 days, but where is it? Is it uh, Numbers 34 and 14, is it? Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember where it is, but it says there's a day for a year. So prophetically, those two are inter interchangeable. So although they're supposed to be here for four di 40 days, they ended up being out here for 40 years because of their disobedience. Now, <clears throat> after that 40-year period, the people who came out of Egypt, um, the original people who came out of Egypt, they all died off, save uh, Eleazar, Phineas, and um, Caleb. All right. And under the leadership of Joshua, the son of Nun, the newborn, those who were born here, not born in bondage, but born free here in the wilderness of Sinai, they were the ones who inherited this Canaan land or this land flowing with milk and honey, which had been promised to their forefather, Abraham. They went through this divided waters of the River Jordan. And yes, the River Jordan also heaped up into a tunnel and they went through here on dry ground. And so this would be like an unto that veil, the veil of the flesh or the sixth step, and they inherited Canaan land. This was a land where they didn't have to build their houses, the food was ready, and um, they, 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 just, they just inherited this. Um, now they did, they did have to fight, but this was prepared for them. Um, 
and Yahweh had promised it to them. And so this would be likened unto their ultimate resting place or where they could, where they could dwell. And this Canaan land um, is a type and a shadow of, um, you see how it says here, Jerusalem? Uh, it's, it's a, um, I, get the, I think the old name for Jerusalem, see how it says here in there, Salem? It was Salem, and it's like a city of peace. This is a place where they could rest. Um, and this is what Yahweh had promised them, was a rest. Now, this is a physical migration, threefold and seven steps in principle. Um, and it's showing that Yahweh's in control of the things that's happening down here in the earth plane, all right? And everything's going according to his dictates. And we've got to look for our principles of death burial, resurrection, ascension, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. We see it with many things. So if I just go get this green chart, um, this chart also shows some examples of how Yahweh is threefold and also how things are moving according to this, this pattern. I just want to take an example of, um, we've got the, the seasons of the year and you've got uh, a winter, which is a death. I'm sorry, you've got a fall, which is a death. You have a winter, which is a burial. You have a spring, which is a resurrection. And then you have a summer, which is an ascension. So you see how even the seasons of the year are going according to the pattern. They're operating according to the pattern. See, um, you've got your um, smallest building block of living matter being a cell. Um, it's a, uh, a nucleus, a, nu a nucleolus, a nucleus, and a cell body, but it's one cell. Um, You've got the DNA, the RNA, and the ribosomes, okay? You also have the smallest building block of matter being a, uh, an atom. It's a proton, a neutron, an electron, but it is one atom. So you see how Yahweh has placed these witnesses here in the earth plane so we don't have any excuse for not knowing him as he really is and as he actually exists. Now, if I may go back here to, I'm sorry, to this chart, which is, again, the a tabernacle of man chart, we'll find that man is made in Yahweh Elohim's image and likeness. He is threefold yet one in his structure, being a head cavity, a chest cavity, and an abdominal cavity. Um, threefold yet one man. Now, in the wilderness of Sinai, if you remember, I talked about how the children of Israel came and they were there for some 40 years. Well, Yahweh put them into camps and they were in camps according to their their tribes. Not when I say camps, I meant I mean the tribes that were in their tribes. And those there were 12 tribes of Israel. And when we look at this uh, body of man, not only is it threefold, but it also has these limbs. And these limbs are also threefold: hand, lower arm, upper arm, foot, lower leg, upper leg. Uh, three times four is twelve. And these 12 members, if I could say it that way, they carry around this threefold temple or tabernacle. Can you get uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19? Because Paul talks to us about how this is a temple or a tabernacle for the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a physical body and it's temporal. It's going to go to uh, the ground, from you know, go back to the earth from where it came. Uh, but you'll notice that a manifestation, these bones they are typifying something because you can, the flesh will go away once you bury this body, once it's physically dead, but the bones can go on for, for many, many years. Um, they are likened onto an example of something that is, I'm not saying it's a type and a shadow of like eternity. Eternity. It is a silent witness that there's actually a body within a body, or that the soul is actually what's housed in this temple or in this tabernacle. So this body is a temple for the Holy Spirit, and you are also made body, soul, and spirit. So these things are important because they show us again how we're made in the image and likeness of Yahweh Elohim. Now we've got a brain that's gray and white crinkle up matter like an unto a cloud, just like you had this cloud here in this tabernacle. You had two uh, sides to this brain, just like you had two archangels. Um, these archangels often referred to as typifying like a Michael and a Gabriel. Michael is a, a warrior angel of action and Gabriel is a communicator. Uh, so you have to have, you know, kind of 
uh, principle, you have your motor and sensory in, in the brain. Um, you also have a pituitary gland and it secretes three, uh, seven hormones, three on one side, seven on the other, just like this table of, uh, or, what do you call it? Um, our, sorry, um, Ten Commandment law uh, contained in this Ten Commandment law on this table of stones, what I'm looking for, was three laws on one side, three on the other. So this law governed the children of Israel from conception to maturity, just like this pituitary gland governs this physical body, its growth, its metabolism, its, um, and, and other things it's, it's governing uh, for this body. Okay, um, you also have um, a neck, and this neck is separating your head from your chest, just like this second veil separated the most holy place from the holy place. And this neck has a principle of blue, purple, and scarlet because it's got a thyroid gland. And this thyroid gland um, has that principle of um, uh, this iodine, which would be like unto purple, and you've got um, you've got that principle blue, um, blue, purple, and scarlet here with the thyroid gland, just like you had a blue, purple, and scarlet veil um, around here. Um, oh, I should mention this because I've really been thinking about these angels. These angels embellished on this, um, on this veil, you know, you've got astrocytes in your brain. Um, so that's a pretty example of being like an unto a principle of the angel. So that's something that's important to bring out. And then when you go through this second veil and you go into this holy place, we've got a principle of intercession and there's four principal ingredients that are um, helping um, with uh, waffle up into the nostrils of Yahweh here. So we've got this air principle with um, your respiratory system, right? You've got your two lobes and you've got uh, four main ingredients that make up air. And this is what's breathing and keep what allows you to breathe and keeps this body alive. Um, and that would be like an unto, in principle, this altar of incense. And then you've got, and, and it's also, you need that air in order to breathe for this brain operate too. Um, and then you've got this principle of a lampstand. Well, you've got this seven branch aorta that comes off of this heart and it flickers in the, uh, and it brings life to this body, just like this was light uh, and it flickered when this, wind would blow through this door, just like this diaphragm causes, uh, as you breathe, the uh, diaphragm kind of moves, if you will. Um, so that would be your principle of a veil. Um, and then you have a four chambered heart, and just like you have this four, uh, four, four corners of this table of shoe bread, the average man pumps about 12 pints of blood, just like you had 12 loaves of bread here on this altar. Um, this table shoe bread, okay? Talked about the diaphragm being that principle of a veil. And then you also have adrenal glands that sit on this kidneys and it, it, it provides fight or flight. Uh, so you could see how it would be like into, onto spirit. Uh, and then you have this laver, which would be like an onto your kidneys. And while they're separated in the body to show forth as a kind of a silent witness that Yahweh did indeed separate the Red Sea. You can see that it does cleanse the blood just like you had like this bloody water that had to be separated out and it had to uh, put clean water in there and high priest would wash in there. Um, you have a bladder and you've got this basin and there would be a spigot that would let this water out. You've got this um, oh, in, uh, intestines, right? You have the large and the small intestines and it looks like a kind of a grating system, just like you have this altar of, in, uh, altar of uh, sin sacrifice here, with this grating system here. And there was a continuum burning here, just like as you eat food and it gets digested, uh, those digestive juices are breaking down that food and it's ultimately passing through these intestines um, and goes out the gate, uh, just like the things that were in this altar, um, there were shovels and you would take the things that were in this um, altar and you know and you would take them outside the gate so and there's four principal uh, areas of blood on these intestines just like you had the high priest putting four points of blood on these horns here on this altar so you had four primary pr or principal areas of blood on these uh, I think it's the ascending descending sigmoid and transverse colon okay so I just wanted to show forth that 
this pattern is operation. We saw it with the migration of the children of Israel. We see it with the high priest and how he operated daily and yearly in this tabernacle. And we also see it with man. And we not only want to look at our types and shadows, but we want to understand what does that mean spiritually and psychologically. So when we think about Romans 1, 19 and 20, which states we can understand the invisible things of our creator by looking at the things that are made, we can look at this migration and we can see that people were held in bondage. They did not know how Yahweh wanted to be worshipped, so they had to come out of this state and condition. So we as souls of men have to come out of the darkness or the ignorance that we're in so that we might start to journey or make a migration out through the erroneous doctrine that has buried us um, and caused us to go astray. I said at the top of the lecture that this is a school and we want to learn something about Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. We don't want it skewed with uh, any erroneous doctrine and that would be like an unto what this water might represent in in this particular manifestation there's a two-fold function with that labor but right now i'm just talking about that we're inundated in in um untruths uh that we haven't been told the truth about our creator um when i was a kid i used to look up and think that there were angels up there and i took my first uh airplane ride and i was sure enough looking for those angels i figured well i guess i'm just not up high enough but um you know i was probably all of 12 or so but at that age still looking because that's where i was told god was was up above the sun moon and star stars well come to find out that he actually is right within us um and we'll get that scripture i think i have you holding first corinthians uh, 6 19. um but as a soul we have to come out of this ignorance, out of this bondage, and we have to be following Yahshua Messiah, who is spirit. And it is his words that are really what we're eating. Um, whereas the um, Job says, the ear tries words as the mouth tastes meat. But we know that we have to hear the words of Yahweh or that truth to be resurrected, just like the children of Israel had to hear what Yahweh was saying through Moses and obey so that they may, just, they may um, escape. Uh, the plagues down here in Egypt, they were not partakers of the last seven, and they were able to ultimately leave Egypt or leave the bondage from Pharaoh, who represented that beast man of sin or that satanic spirit that had them in physical bondage. Well, we as souls of men have to recognize that there's a presence, uh, that there's a force, that there's a mystery of iniquity, and it's no match for the mystery of Yahweh. Yahweh uh, has complete control over both mysteries. Um, but we have to understand that there's a force down here that's looking to keep us in this bondage or in this state and condition. Um, and so we, we have to come out of the erroneous doctrine following Yahshua Messiah, and there we can start to get some light or illumination. So you've got our principle of light here, <clears throat> but light could be also unto knowledge. We have to have a knowledge and understanding of our creator. Yahweh thunder down these laws um but in the scripture it says yahweh he he didn't delight in the sacrifice and 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 them keeping the law from a natural standpoint he really preferred obedience can you find that for me obedience is better than sacrifice okay so we have to be obedient to the words of yahweh and that's how we become illuminated and we if we eat his words which would be likened unto that table of shoe bread and we rely on him and him alone as our intercessor then we can begin to grow or be born again. Just like these people who came out, that old man came out of Egypt into the wilderness of Sinai, that old man had to die off. So we as souls men, that old man has to die off. We have to get rid of hate, malice, strife, sedition, the works of the flesh that are in Galatians, the fifth chapter. And when those things start to fall off, we become born again. So we're likened unto a little child. That's why the Messiah said, you know, you know, the ch suffer the little children to come on to him. We have to be as a little child, humble uh, and willing to learn. We don't know everything. And the things that we don't understand, we have to just acknowledge that and ask to be shown. Now, once we can get to that state and condition, and this is the condition that um, Yahshua Messiah was talking to Nicodemus about in John, the third chapter, I think it was, um, where Nicodemus said, Well, how can a man enter into his mother's womb again and be born? And, and that's not the type of birth or rebirth that uh, Yahshua was referring to. He's talking about the soul being born again. And this example of the children of Israel's progeny being born out here and ultimately inheriting this land is our example for us to understand what I'm explaining. 
Okay. So once the soul is born again, then he, this, this veil is no longer a hindrance. He can see over um, and he can see his inheritance. And that inheritance is the kingdom of Yahweh. We're not looking for a kingdom down here on the earth plane. We're looking for a kingdom that is not of this world. Um, and, and Yash Messiah said that. He says, look, if my kingdom of, were of this world, then my, my um, servants, they would fight. Um, and see, all of these things, they're testifying of Yash Messiah because he is the true sacrifice. It's his blood that was shed that allows us to make that migration from darkness into light. His four points of blood pointed to the lamb back here in Egypt. This was done 1,500 and some odd years before Yash Messiah was on the earth plane, and he came in to be the ultimate sacrifice. This sacrifice was a type and a shadow. This sacrifice was a type and a shadow. It's a sacrifice uh, that caused blood to be shed for the innocent because it pointed to Yash Messiah. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. He was uh the stone was rolled away and he resurrected out of this state and condition. He resurrected into another form. He, he resurrected a life giving or a quickening spirit. And I believe, sorry, looking at my Bible here. Um, it was in the scripture lesson that it talked about how, you know, we are, we are part of his body. So um, we're going to end on Ephesians, the second chapter probably around, oh, just closed it. Um, Lisa, you asked for First Samuel also, 15 and 20. About the sacrifices? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's get some of those scriptures because I'm running out of time. Um, let's go ahead and get uh, sacrifices. Uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. And okay. then we'll get First I'll, I'll, Corinthians. I'll, I'll start in 19, okay? 19 okay. verse. Thank you. First Samuel 15, 19. Wherefore then didst thou now did didst thou not obey the voice of Yahweh, but did did fly upon the spoils and did evil in the sight of Yahweh? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh, and have gone the way which Yahweh sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto Yahweh thy Elohim in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has Yahweh as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected thee from being king. Okay, so it's important that we obey that voice. And so Yash Messiah, when he's walking in his ministry, he says, I am that bread of life that come down from heaven. He said, um, he said I am the door. Uh, what else did he say? He, um, I am that living bread, if any man, and he also said he is that uh, living water as well. So you could see how he's talking and he's operating according to the pattern as well. And he ultimately resurrected and he came back in another form and outpoured the Holy Spirit, which caused this, which began us being uh, brought back into the state and condition that was lost by Adam and Eve when they transgressed in the garden, which again was part of the purpose of Yahweh, but Yahweh had to get us back into a state and condition where we were one with him. And that's what this whole migration is about, is moving the soul from a state of death to a, to a life or a quickening spirit and making us a habitation of that spirit. So let's get 1 Corinthians 6.19. I'll quote it. What? No, you're not. That you're, you got it? First Corinthians 6 and 19. 19. What? No, you not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of Yahweh, and ye are not your own. For you are brought with a price. 
therefore glorify Yahweh in your spirit and in, in your body and in your spirit, which are his. Right, which are his. We are his temple. We are his tabernacle. He is operating in us if we are quickened. So as the physical body could be dead um, or alive, then the soul can be dead or alive. And we want to go from a death-like state of not knowing our creator, because that's what that ignorance is, is, is pointing to. We want to be resurrected and shaped and formed in the spirit. Uh, and in Yahshua Messiah, learn how he wants to be worshipped and, and learn how to be obedient so we can ultimately be part of this kingdom or this body or this temple. Now, Solomon's temple. I uh, minutes, please, okay, thank you. Represented a, it would look like a man sitting on a throne. Um, and the weather beaten tabernacle, which be likened onto these physical bodies, as we start to get up there in age, they start getting weather beaten, aches and pains, and all kinds of stuff. Well, that would be likened onto this weather beaten tabernacle. And Yahshua um, says that they, you know he wants gold tried in fire. So the golden vessels are moved from this weather beaten tabernacle into this temple as a permanent resting place. Um, and that's we want to be. Uh, built up a spiritual temple or tabernacle. And so that's what all these temples and tabernacles were pointing to, where that we were built up uh, um, a habitation through the spirit. Do I have anything else held except for Ephesians? No. So can you get us Romans before, but I don't know if you still need it. Uh, was that 119? No, I think I quoted that one. Thank you. Uh, let's get Ephesians 2:19 through through the end, through 2022. Ephesians 2 and 19. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the sons and of the household of Yahweh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of Elohim through the Spirit. Right. So um, that's, that's the whole point of all these different stories and all these different um, historical events that we'll take you through. It's all the reason why um, that we're down here is so that we could seek Yahweh where he may be found. And our aim is to help you find and know Yahweh Elohim as he really is and actually exists. And when that knowledge comes to you, you can begin that spiritual and psychological journey out of Babylon, mystery Babylon or Egypt. So if you got anything out of that, I'd like to say all praise goes to Yahshua the Messiah, and I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second speaker for this evening it will be a pleasure to call on visiting brethren, Ron Carr from the spring, um, uh, South, which branch? I'm sorry. Springfield. Vice President. Vice President. Vice President, thank you, of the Springfield branch. Thank you. I'm very happy and glad to be here. And I truly enjoyed uh, what came forth from the first speaker. Uh, it was uh, really great. And that was <laughs> truly Yahshua and Messiah speaking through that vessel. And uh, what's been on my mind lately is uh, the term image and idols. Now, we see a lot of people out here today that they've got their mind on the physical. They're worried about uh, Black Lives Matter, which to a certain degree that it is true. And there's a lot of things going on out here. But in my mind, all souls ma matter, you know? And uh, I was looking at uh, a term, uh, the definition of image and idols. And as I was looking at the uh, definition of image, it says that it is a physical likeness or rep representation of a person or thing. And also it can mean, or as a synonym, an idea or conception. And idol 
or representation of a sculpture or deity. It can also mean imagine or perceive. And we know that uh, heathens worship idols. The term idol, the definition is an image or as a statue. It can also mean uh, a false uh, conception a fantasy or a fallacy or notion. Now, someone get me please, Isaiah 55 and eight. We'll begin with that. And this is what Yahweh's thoughts are. <laughs> Isaiah 55 and eight. Um, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my way, saith Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So Yahweh's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And what we have to do is get on a level with Yahweh, or have Yahshua, that's Holy Spirit, in our heart and in our mind. Now one can have an idol, such as a car, a home, a wife, and many other things. And then we also see that one can be uh, uh, really concerned about their church, you know. And then we see also in this institute that they've set up idols. Dr. Kenley, Dr. Harris. Now we see these things. Now we're right down at the end. Now there were three things that Yahweh had man to build. One was the ark. And the ark had a lower deck. It had uh, a middle deck and an upper deck. Then as the first speaker was telling you about the tabernacle, a court roundabout, a holy place and a most holy place. And she also mentioned about the temple. The temple had a porch, a sanctuary, and an oracle. Those three make up one ark, make up one tabernacle, and one temple. Now, this is what Yahweh used, and each was threefold, but one construction. Now, Satan is going to try to change things that Yahweh has purposed. He was kicked out of heaven. Because of his beauty and glory, he thought he was better than all the other angels. He even thought he was better than Yahweh himself. And so Yahweh said, look, Michael, this job is too easy for me. Now, Michael, you're a warrior angel. Now, you take, I want you to kick Satan out of heaven because he's causing a tremendous disturbance up here, and I just can't take it. So he kicked Satan out. and those demonic spirits and cast them right on into the earth plane. Now man came from the earth, say, and Yahweh created a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. And Satan was cast out to deceive. Now give me Job 1 and 7, please. Now this is what Job in the book of Job is saying about this satanic spirit, Job 1 and 7. This is Job 1 and 7. Start with maybe the sixth verse. Okay, Job 1 and 6. Now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan came along, among, and Satan was among them. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. So now what he's doing, he's going through the earth plane to deceive he and his demonic spirits. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Adam and Eve, they have two children. And they were Cain and Abel. Cain was the elder and Abel was the younger one. Now, 
they offered up a sacrifice due to the fact that uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and they had uh, problems with their conscience because of that, see? And Cain offered up of the ground and Abel offered of his sheep. Now, there was a problem with that. Yahweh selected or chose because it was in his purpose, he chose the sacrifice of Abel. And the reason why he did, because Abel offered up of, of, of a sheep, see? And Cain offered up the ground. Well, it wasn't time yet for that because Adam and Eve fell from, came on out of that garden of Eden. So there would have to be a sacrifice made. And it's pointing to the sacrifice that Yahshua and Messiah would have to die on that cross. So Yahweh, in his purpose, chose uh, Abel's sacrifice over uh, Cain. Now, as we go on uh, down through time, we see that Cain becomes a vagabond and a wanderer. And Yahweh puts a mark on Cain, and that mark is 666. And his wife conceived a child by the name of Enoch. Then, due to the mind that was in, the satanic mind that was in Cain, he built a city, and he named it after his son's name, Enoch. Get me Psalms 49 and 11. Psalms 49 and 11. The inward thoughts is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations they came their lands after their own name. And so they called they called their names after their after their own self, actually. Say, all right, now we want also now Genesis eleven and four. There's there's a principle I'm trying to run here about image and idols. Genesis eleven and four. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Uh, why don't you start with one? Let's start at one. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and built there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make us brick and burn them thoroughly, that they may have brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. They said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. See, now they... What's going on here? They're imagining this. Remember what we we're talking about, imaginations. Mm -hmm. See? So now, here they are going to build a tower, and it's the Tower of Babel. Now, that's what Satan is always doing. He's building things without the divine instruction of Yahweh. And as we stated earlier, and you heard from the first speaker, there were only three things that Yahweh caused, had man to build. That was the ark, the tabernacle, and the temple. Now, they imagined what they did, what they want. Now, read the seventh and eighth verse. Genesis 11 and 7. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Now notice this. They're going to build a city. 
they built the Tower of Babel. Cain built a city and named it after his son, Enoch. So Satan's out here building without the, the divine instruction of Yahweh. So Satan is always against what Yahweh says. If Yahweh says do, he says don't do. If Yahweh says don't do it, he says do. So he's doing everything he does is the opposite of what Yahweh ha has dictated. Now, Babel means confusion. And so they built this Tower of Babel. Their language was confused just as Christendom is today. And I will also add, as some are in the Institute today, they come up with things that are not in the Bible, and they are truly, truly ridiculous. Now, Yahweh confused their language. Now, I need Exodus 1 and 11. Exodus 1 and 11. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. And continue. No, that's good. So we got Pharaoh now. He's having the children of Israel build treasure cities. And this is without Yahweh's instruction. So as we're looking at, Satan is out here building. See? Built the, built the city of Enoch, built the Tower of Babel, and then they built a city. See? And they were scattered abroad, broad, just as we stated about Job 1 and 7. That uh, said that where where you come said going to and fro in the earth plane. See see how this pattern is really working. Now today, Satan is similar to Pharaoh because he has man building churches. Now we look what Noah it took him a hundred and twenty years to build the ark. Well, Satan is going to try to copy that. So what did he do? He had the Roman Catholics build St. Peter's Basilica. And guess how long that took them to build that? 120 years. Satan is a copycat, and he will never be on the right track. Never, never, ever will be on the right track. Give me Exodus 20 and 4 and read through the fifth verse. Now remember what we're talking about, talking about image or idols. This is Exodus 20 and 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh, thy Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. So, that, so he says, do not build a graven image. So anything else that is being done is not in the purpose and plan of Yahweh as far as Yahweh is concerned, but the satan but he does have Satan working against the purpose and plan of Yahweh. So Satan is going to always be building something. He tries to build things up in your mind, give you concepts, theories, and opinions, see, and build these things up in your mind. And it only takes, it has to take Joshua, the Holy Spirit, to tear that away and put his spirit in your heart and your mind and put you right on the right track. Give me Exodus, the 23rd chapter. And would you read 22 to 24? This is Exodus 23, 22 to 24. 
But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amor Amorites and the Hittites and the Pesites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite, quite break down their images. So you said to, that they break down and he's going to have the, his angel, which was Joshua, the son of Nun, Nun. And he said to break down their images. So now let's go a little further. Give me Exodus uh, 32 and read the first through the fourth verse. And let's see what the children of Israel have done. Now what happened here is before you start reading here, they're getting a little shaky here because Moses had gone up into this mountain into in the cloud. And this Joshua, the son of Nun, was the one that called him up there and, and went up there with him and transformed, as you heard the first speaker tell you, into this Elohistic figure, Yahweh Elohim, Joshua, and then transformed back into this intangible threefold tabernacle back into himself and then into the days of creation. Now Moses was up there for 40 days and they uh, were a little shaky here. Uh, you know, Moses has got to be dead, see? So then they put it in, it was in their minds by the satanic spirit now to say they're gone. So let us uh, do some things here. Let us. We saw those idols down there that the uh, Israelites or the uh, Egyptians uh, 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 honored see, and worship. And so then let us make us a God. Let us make us, we, uh, you know, and see, that was in their mind. That was in their heart. And just mm -hmm. those days that it, it was gone, see, that really shook them up. That really worried them, see. Mm -hmm. So... On the 32nd chapter, read the first through the fourth verse, if you will. Exodus 32 and 1. And when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us deities, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf, and they said, These be thy deities, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So here they are, because they imagined, and remember we're talking about images and idols, they imagined, and that was one of the... Uh, uh, words that, uh, that uh, pertain to the imagine and idols, and that they imagine that Moses had left them, and so they build a golden calf. Now get me at the end of Exodus. I'd like to have Exodus 32, and I think it's 31 through 34, if you will. Exodus 32 and 31. And Moses returned unto Yahweh and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, 
and have made them deities of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So he had a book of life. And in that book of life were the names of all the people that were ever born in this entire creation. And Moses said, blot my name out for them. He's trying to be uh, uh, intercede for them, see? But see, no, Yahweh said, whoever goes against me and sins against me, those, that's the, those names are going to be blotted out. Now, give me uh, Deuteronomy 4 and 2. And then skip down to 16 and read through 20. Deuteronomy 4 and 2. You said skip down to what, 16? Uh, 16, yeah, at, through 20. But read the second verse and then skip down to 16. Okay, you shall not add unto the words which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you. And 16, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast, that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Least thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest thou be driven to worship them and serve them which Yahweh thy Elohim have divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But Yahweh has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. Now notice what is stated there, that Yahweh brought them out of an iron furnace. Well, we're going to see something a little later here about an iron furnace. Get me 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. And this is dealing with David and Goliath. Now, Goliath is about nine and a half feet tall. And David is nothing but a little scrawny young man. But David goes up against this Goliath. And Goliath has the number six on him. If you, when you read there, you see the number six on Goliath. David has the name of Joshua with him. All right. Give me 1 Samuel, as I stated, um, 17 and 43. This is 1 Samuel 17 and 43. And now when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdrained him, for he was for he was about a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Did you want me to keep going? Yes. Okay. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give, give flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. And said, Dave, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, 
but I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of hosts and the Elohim of their of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defiled. So this David day, says, I'm coming in the name of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. okay. Now continue to read. Okay, 46. This day will Yahweh deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowl of the air and to the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is Elohim in the Israel, that there is an Elohim in Israel. And oh, okay, now look, look what's going on here. Now Goliath was like an idol to his people, nine and a half feet tall. And then you got little David here, small little, ruddy look, little individual. And, he's, and he says, I'm coming in the name of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And then he took five smooth stones. Five is what? Pentecost, see? Showing forth Pentecost. And he took those stones. And, and what happened to Goliath? Got got rid of him, didn't he? Got rid of Goliath. Give me First Samuel seventeen forty five, if, if you would. Sorry about all these uh, scriptures, but you know this is how Yahweh works through me, <laughs> and I, I'm not going to apologize. I will not apologize. <laughs> and also, I am not a good quoter. <laughs> and then, uh, please get me. The next one it would be First Kings eighteen and seventeen. Okay, this is uh, First Samuel seventeen. You said forty-five. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, I think she just read that. No, did we? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. All right, First Kings eighteen and seventeen. First Kings eighteen and seventeen. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh, and has followed Balaam. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. And, he, and Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mark Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long wilt thou halt between two opinions? If Yahweh be Elohim, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Continue. Okay, well, now here, what we have here, Baal is an idol god. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about idols. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a test to prove the true Elohim. 450 prophets on one side and just Elijah with Yahweh on the other side. While the prophets of Baal call for their gods, Elijah is poking fun at them. Later, when it is Elijah's turn, he prepares a sacrifice on the altar and prays. Then fire comes down from heaven and consumes everything on that altar. And the people had to confess that Yahweh is the true Elohim. Now, this has to be shown. This is something for us to really realize here, to really look back and see how that if Yahweh is on your side, you have nothing to worry about. If Yahweh is in, if Yahshua, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, is in your soul, you have nothing to worry about because he's there. 
He's not going to jump back out. He's in there permanently. You are sealed. And you're translated now, just like Elijah was back then. You're translated into the kingdom in your heart, in your mind. That's, that's really, really wonderful when you see that. Now, the people had to confess that Yahweh is the true Elohim. Isaiah 21 and 9. But Isaiah 21 and 9, I'll just say this. It's talking about Babylon. I got it. Oh, you got it? Okay. Okay, Isaiah 21 and 9. And behold, here cometh the chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her deities he hath broken unto the ground. Okay, so Babylon is fallen. On, and these carnal concepts got to be removed. See, Babylon fall. And Babylon was in your, when, before Yahshua came in our hearts and mind, we had Babylon in our mind. See, these carnal concept, concepts. Give me Isaiah 44 and read from 9 to uh, 11. And then I'll tell you where else to go. <clears throat> Isaiah 44, 9. That they that make graven images are all of them vanity, and their delectable things which are which shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god or a molten image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. See, now, the children of Israel, when they went from country to country, they went to these countries, and they saw, just like what happened down with the children of Israel down in Egypt, they began to associate with the people. And then they took on these gods themselves. Mm -hmm. See, and remember that Yahweh said, do not worship any graven image. He absolutely said that. So you can see how the satanic spirit gets in one's mind. I'm trying to bring it up to date. Gets in one's mind and the concept, see, uh, with that satanic uh, theories, concepts, and opinions, see, and causes man to do things that are totally against the, uh, uh, Yahweh and his purpose. And Yahweh's not going to stand for that. See, he's not going to stand for that. Now, let's look at another example. Now, we got Daniel in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. So let's read a little bit about that. Daniel 2 and 31 through 35. And I'll tell you where else to go. This is Daniel 2 and 31. Oh, 2 and 31. Thou, O king, soweth and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent for thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was, this image head, this image head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. His now legs. Did you see this? No. Pardon me. You see this? It's talking about an image or an idol. See? Mm -hmm. And as you look at this chart, it's saying proving the existence and destruction of Satan 
See, now it's just telling you about that Satan is going to be cast to the lake of fire. You see what I'm saying? And it's showing the proving the existence and destruction of Satan and his demons down through the dispensations and ages. But if you follow what was being stated here right from the beginning, that man has, has set up idols. He's built these churches, see? And he's done all these things against Yahweh. But it's all in the purpose of Yahweh. And why is it in the purpose of Yahweh? It's to show his greatness, his love, his beauty. Because when you come and see how he works his pattern down through dispensations and ages, and he reveals these things to you, you see the beauty, the glory, the diamonds, the pearls that Yahweh has put in your heart and in your mind. And he takes those idols that once were and throws them on away and cast them away. See, mm -hmm. that's how it is. It's This purpose of Yahweh is wonderful, folks. Mm -hmm. All right, now continue to read in Daniel. This, this is Daniel 2 and 33. Um, yeah, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sowest till thou sowest till a stone was cut out without hands. Which now see that stone, that stone represents Joshua and Messiah. And those are those that image or that idol. See that going across in that chart. See, a uh, 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 mystery Babylon, see, see, and, and media Persia and Greece and pagan and pa papal Rome. See, that's that image, that's those images that's in men's minds down through time and said that stone, which is Joshua the Messiah, he is the true rock. He is the stone. So it hit it where, read? Um, which, which smote the image upon his feet. Upon his feet, read. That were of iron and clay mm -hmm. and break them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke to pe broken to pieces together, and became and became like the calf of summer. Thrust, dress flooring, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, now, in Daniel, the third chapter, we find about these three guys. I've got to run now. It looks like it's getting close here <laughs> to the, the end of uh, this, let, uh, this uh, class. Um, and we find out Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are in a fiery furnace because they would not bow down to that image. See, mm -hmm. that's in Daniel, the third chapter. See, got to run. Now, if we find in Daniel, the sixth chapter, see, the, the Mish, you've got Meshach, Shadrach, and they're in that fiery furnace, and we find out that when the king looked in there, he saw what? He saw four men, see, mm -hmm. and one like the son mm -hmm. of Yahweh. Who, who do you think that was? That was Joshua, the Messiah, right there. And see, that just shows you that if you're in Joshua, he's going to protect you, going to protect you. Then we find out in the sixth chapter of Daniel, they got Daniel in the lion's den because he wouldn't bow down to that image, see? And these images and idols reflect also the burdens that Satan has put on man in this present age and dispensation by these carnal ordinances and laws. The Roman Catholics have idols or images, Mary, see, saints such as Anthony and others. And I was able to go to uh, Rome and I, I was able to go right into the Vatican. And I saw these great, and I'm, they're not great, but they're beautiful. These images that were on the wall, see, statues and what have you. Then went to a couple other churches there in Rome and saw how that they uh, uh, bowed down to these 
uh, uh, sons, St. Anthony, and all the all these saints that they have. See, that's Yahweh put these concepts, theories, opinions in men. See? And it's not serving Yahweh at all. Not serving Yahweh. Give me now Matthew 15 and 9. Okay, Matthew 15 and 9. Start about 8. Start at 8, please. Okay, 15 and 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Or idols or images. And then Isaiah 66, 3 and 4, Yahweh says, I will choose their delusions. Now, give me Acts 15 and 5, and then read through 11, please. Acts 15 and 5. Uh, and there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when they had been much disputating, disputing, sorry, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago Elohim made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And Elohim, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no differences between us and them, purifying their heart by faith. Continue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, therefore, why tempt ye Elohim? to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, we shall be saved even as they. Then so it has to be the Holy Spirit in them. And that's serving those laws that they, the Jews once have. And they wanted to put that on the Gentiles. So I got to kind of run now. Acts 17. And uh, read a little bit in the 17th chapter of Acts. Okay. And then we've also find out in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in the 5th verse. It's talking about casting down imaginations, see, mm -hmm. and having that Holy Spirit put in you. Casting down those imaginations, those images, those idols, see. And what we have to do is we look back there. See, we were told in the first Corinthians, the 10th chapter, to look back there because they are for what? Our admonition. See, mm -hmm. for our admonition. Looking back at what those what happened down through time and see how that man served those images and idols and what have you. And we don't want that now. See, we got Yahshua and Messiah in our heart and in, my, in our mind. See, we're, we're looking past the flesh, even though we live in the flesh. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank Second you. Corinthians 10 and 5. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's talking about casting down imaginations. But then we look in Acts, the 17th chapter, and it goes in there and tells, yeah, I, I'd like to have that. I don't have much time left. Okay. Kenyatta, do you have... Uh... You have Second Corinthians. Well, that's talking about casting down imaginations. Okay. Uh, right. I, I Go have back to Acts one. seventeen and sixteen to thirty. Okay. This is Acts seventeen sixteen. Now, while pa Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. And with the devout persons and the markets daily with them that met with him. Then certain of the philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him 
and said, what will this babbler say? Others, other, and others some, they seem to be a settler forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Yahshua and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into Arapaia saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest. For thou bringest strange things in our ears, and would, would we know therefore what these things mean? For all the Athenians and strangers which were spent, which were there, spent their time in nothing else rather but to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. And as I passed by and held your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. See, now yeah. these are idols, and then they also had uh, these- Ron, documents. excuse me, five, five minutes, Ron, excuse me, sorry. Okay, okay. go ahead. There, okay, to the unknown God, there, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, declare I, him declare I unto you. Yahweh, who made the world and all things therein, seeing he is ruler of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. He dwells worship, not in temples made with hands, say, read. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he, so he doesn't need anything from you, see. Uh -huh. And what he does do, he gives you something, read. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can give unto him, see. Mm -hmm. Read. He can give it to all life and breath and all things. And have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and had determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek Yahweh, as happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our beings, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of Yahweh, we ought not to think that Elohim or the Godhead. It's likened unto gold or silver or stones graven by art and men's devices. At the time of this ignorance, Yahweh winked at, but now he winked, he winked at that time, but now he's not winking, right? But now commanded all men everywhere to repent. To repent. Now I'm gonna finish with this last one. Give me Colossians, the second chapter. And read from 6 to 13. Second chapter, 6 to 13. All right, I got it. Colossians, second chapter, verse 6. For as ye has therefore received the Messiah, Yahshua, our Savior, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophies and vain, and vain deceit. Now, I want to hold it just right there. Now, that's what happened down through time. Mm -hmm. Those idols, those images, right? Mm -hmm. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after the Messiah. And not after the Messiah, read. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the supernal nature bodily. For ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities in power, and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hand, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision in the Messiah. Buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Yahweh, who hath raised him from the dead. Oh, so wait a minute. You can be risen. In your heart and in your mind, he rose a quickening spirit. And then when he comes in your heart and mind, he has risen in you. He rose again. Now, in some mission, we all need to keep our concentration on Yahshua as we're down here at the end of an age. We're on the brink of eternity or the close of this age and we see all these things happening see yahweh is not winking anymore yahweh is upset with things in this world no one is thinking about him 
as far as out here in the world. The, world, the name has been given to them, Yahweh, and they breathe that name. And then we see that what they're doing, they're still not coming because that's in the purpose of Yahweh. And we should all be happy that he has given unto this, uh, unto us these pearls and these great, beautiful things that he reveals unto us daily. And that's what we should be doing. Do you realize we're in the cloud when we're doing on these Zoom clouds, uh, uh, Zoom classes? Now look over here. Yahweh is pure spirit, as the first speaker was telling you about. That's in the cloud. Everything's in the cloud. It's coming forth through Elohim, through, through right on through. It, it's in the cloud. We're in the cloud too, right now. The internet is the cloud. Um, Praise. Praise Sorry. be to Yahshua. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. That will conclu conclude class for this evening. The announcements for tonight um, uh, is that we'll have class Monday and Thursday, 7.30 to 9.30, and Sunday from 12 to 1, I mean, from 12 to 2. Um, if that is it, let us all stand to be dismissed in doxology. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you from falling. I'm sorry. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before mm -hmm. times now and forever. Mm -hmm. Let us all say, Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.